everyone, this is the first lecture that I'm giving online for the course in statistical field theory slash theoretical methods for soft matter, depending on which degree program students are enrolled with. As you know, the course has a different title. So let's go straight into the subject, and in case this won't work, we'll see how to deliver the class in different ways. So what I'm going to be talking today is basically technical material, as opposed to what we've been doing in the last several lectures. So up to this point, our main focus was mostly conceptual. The idea was to revisit uh, the concept of uh, a theoretical um, framework for describing physical phenomena or a physical theory in the framework of modern renormalization group theory. And if you might remember, uh, this essentially corresponds with a in sort of paradigmatic shift that a theory is not just defined by, say, a Hamiltonian, let it be classical or quantum, but it's defined by two more main ingredients, a Hamiltonian and a scale. And the scale specifies at which, resolu at which resolution the Hamiltonian is supposed to be a description of a physical phenomena, and the Hamiltonian contains content terms, and the content terms they contain parameters that encode our ignorance into the ultraviolet physics. We are not supposed to be explicitly taken into account. So that was the, in a nutshell, whatever we did in the last several lectures. Now, for a couple of lectures, perhaps three, uh, we're going to shift gears completely and move into technical aspects. And the problem you're going to face is given a Hamiltonian and implicitly given a scale where we believe the Hamiltonian, how do we solve it? You know, writing Hamiltonian is a very important step of having a physical theory, but of course, without a solution, uh, we can only look at the Hamiltonian and we cannot validate it, we can do nothing with it. So, how do we solve for a theory? And we're going to develop techniques that enable us that help us both solving exactly the theory in some situations or developing approximation methods to do that. And the technique that we're going to introduce today is a very widespread method that ranges from quantum mechanics to statistical mechanics to stochastic dynamics to most fields of modern theoretical physics, and it's called the path integral formalism or path integration or functional integration is the subject of this, uh, this lecture. And just to start off, I'll be specific and I will consider the derivation of the path integral formalism within the, the context, the cultural context where it, where it was originally developed, that is, uh, dynamics in quantum mechanics. But we shall see later that basically most of this course is about using the same methods in statistical physics, even in a classical system. But we'll get to that. But before we start by defining Feynman's, Richard Feynman's ideas about path integration, let me just give a motivation. Why do we need path integral? Well, the idea of introducing path integrals uh, can be understood if we take, you say, say, another parallel theory we have confidence on, where we did very similar things already. And as a driving example, let's consider, as an example, let's consider classical electrodynamics or electrostatics, even better. In classical electrostatics, a major, a major advancement in the possibility of solving Maxwell's equations for electrostatics comes from going from, say, the Poisson equation to its quadrature expression. What is a quadrature expression? It is an expression in which the solution of a partial differential equations, the Poisson equation for electrostatics, is obtained explicitly in terms of an integral. So let me give you the specific case. Suppose I want the electrostatic field. I might be doing some typos or 
factor missing since a long time, I haven't done electrostatics. That's the equation we want to solve with appropriate boundary conditions to get the electrostatic field given a given charge distribution rule. And a way to express that is to write the electrostatic field as a convolution between some kernel, this is the Coulomb kernel, and a charge distribution. Now, from the point of view of theory, up to minor considerations that we leave for the specialist, this formulation of the electric static field solving for the Poisson equation with given boundary conditions to find phi, and these formulations, computing phi by solving an integral, are basically equivalent from the conceptual point of view. However, there are many reasons why this integral form is so much more convenient than this. And what are these main reasons? Well, uh, well, we can sort of list them into three main key things. So let's see what they are. First of all, computational reasons. Solving a partial differential equation is then hard. And you can do that for simple systems, but when your system becomes high dimensional, for instance, when you have many particles, then it gets extremely complicated. Conversely, solving integrals is technically simpler in many cases. Uh, we, we should never generalize, of course, you know, we should never compare the simplest partial differential equation with the most complicated uh, integral equations. But in general, solving integrals is something we have developed very efficient methods, say from simple Simpsons techniques for one-dimensional integral to uh, Gauss methods to Monte Carlo approaches for large-dimensional integrals. Therefore, basically, going back to the simple case of the electrostatic potential, you know, a conceptually simple way to solve this integral would be divide the volume into up the contribution of all the pieces, reducing this to a sum over pieces and compute explicitly this and add up. I'm not saying this is trivial, but it can be done with computers for three dimensions, while solving partial differential equations with non-trivial source terms and boundary conditions is always challenging. Along with computational reasons, there are also conceptual reasons and approximations opportunity. Let's talk about approximations. One of the reasons integrals are, are, are quite friendly guys from the mathematical point of view is that very often they are minimal to introducing mathematical approximations that turn out to be extremely useful in many contexts. For instance, when we solve for the electrostatic case, we might uh, consider doing the dipole exp the multiple expansion, right? So for instance, we might say we're interested in the field at position very distant from the charge. We discussed that in the, in the context of um, Um, in the context of um, uh, renormalization group theory. And then you might start looking at this object and expanding that interior series. And as you do that interior series, what basically what comes out is that... But what we are seeing here is that integral expressions, for instance, in this case, lead to the multiple approximation. And in general, there are many other types of approximation you can play around when you deal with integrals. Third, conceptual reason, th major advantage of reducing the problem from partial differential equation to quadrature is the possibility of having conceptual insight. And, oh, 
them. Bad spelling. Insight. And by conceptual insight, uh, uh, to be more specific in the physical context, I might say physical insight. Often, integrals are more transparent in terms of the physical context of the theory they encode than differential equations. And none of these statements that I'm making should be taken as, you know, uh, solid and uh, ever true. It's more like a generic indication, but I think uh, it is generally accepted that, you know, integrals reveal a little bit more. And this is already clear in the, in the context of this equation, because if I analyze this equation, uh, I can immediately see that basically what it's telling me is that I'm breaking the volume in, uh, where the charge is distributed in many little volumes, and I'm looking at these little volumes where the charge distribution rho is non-zero as point-like particle with a Coulomb contribution to the potential, electrostatic potential, and then I'm using the linearity of the superposition principle of electrostatics to add them up. And basically what I'm doing, I'm building the electrostatic fields out of the Coulomb interaction of microscopic charges distributed in space, summing all this contribution to a single electrostatic potential field. So, from the mathematical point of view, that's exactly equivalent to what is written here, but this is just a mathematical formula. This idea of breaking things into small pieces and analyzing the individual contribution is a way to physically make sense of why the electrostatic is what it is in this formula up here. So, here it is an example uh, which illustrates quite well what could be the advantages of moving from uh, differential par PDE, partial differential equation formulation of some theory, to an equivalent a formulation in which the solution of that theory are explicitly constructed in terms of some complicated integral. Now, Feynman path integral formalism is essentially this logically the same kind of construction, but rather than apply to the Poisson equation of electrostatics, in, in, a, in its original formulation, it is applied to the Schrodinger equation for a dynamics of a quantum system. And to be specific, in the following lecture, I will concentrate to one-dimensional Schrodinger equation, but this holds true in general for any number of particles as long as they are distinguishable. So n particle, n distinguishable particle non-degenerate system, quantum system. It is possible to extend the indistinguishable particles in dimension, but we can say three-dimensional, why do we more than three, if you're interested in the real world, at least at this level. Uh, if you are interested in degenerate quantum systems, say bosons or fermions, then you can still apply the Feynman path integral, but the formulations and the details becomes much more involved, and, and, and we're not going to treat that here. We're going to leave it as is for, for, for other courses, for instance, the quantum antibody physics course, or condensed matter physics courses. Okay, so that's our goal, solve the Schrodinger equation, for one particle in one dimension, and let me write the full glory Schrodinger equation for this system. Now, we all know and love this equation. This is the quantum Hamiltonian. This is the here. Here is the Dirac's constant, and and we want to find solution of these partial differential equations. And the way we do. We want actually to write the explicit solution given some initial condition, because this is a first-order differential equation in time. So we need an initial state for the system. So we want to solve our goal is to solve equation S given psi of x at time zero. 
t naught. And we're going to sometimes set explicitly the time to zero. So that's our goal. OK, uh, so how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is to write this equation in a more uh, convenient form, and is the following. So let's, uh, let's move forward. Let's see, step one. Introduce the evolution operator. Okay, the evolution operator. So how does the evolution operator work? Well, we all know it's an operator that basically represents, the, in an implicit form, the solution of the Schrodinger equation we just wrote. And it's basically constructed by the usual form. Now, on the right-hand side, this is our known state the initial state, which is supposed to be specified. Maybe we made measurements up to a phase of it. Um, and this is an operator. And when you act with an operator on a state, you get another state that is the function evolved in time. Now, let me also remind you from your basic quantum mechanics course that you can always write this in the following sense. This is the state of the function at time t projecting into position representation, that's what this means. This is basically the results of acting with the evolution operator in some abstract sense of the Hilbert space on the initial wave state, quantum state, and then ultimately projecting onto the position operator. So that's what this all means. Okay, now we have this. Still, it's extremely abstract and there's nothing useful. I cannot teach a computer how to evaluate numerically this guy. And whenever I say something to be solved, I don't really mean in general writing down a mathematical formula for it. What I really mean is that it's reduced to a point that I can just tell a computer a very simple, repetitive procedure through which he can give me a number for every point in space and time. And that, would, that complex number will correspond to the wave function psi of x at time t. So the way to do that is to make one more step, and that's step number two. Define propagators. Okay. So the way we, we saw this and get an explicit expression a quadrature expression for the wave function is by exploiting a very, very simple trick. And the very simple trick is the so-called resolution of identity, which in this particular case reads as follows. I can always write the identity operator in terms of a projection onto a complete orthonormal set of states in my Hilbert space, and in this case I use in the position eigenstates for simplicity, I could have used, in principle, any other states. The use of the position and states, excuse me, is just a matter of convenience in this case. So this is always true, and this is an operator relationship, of course. So what do I do? I take my wave function at time t, which I let me remind you is the projection onto the final position of the quantum state at time t. I write it as my projection operator, we leave some room here, projection operator of my quantum evolution operator relative to some state at time t naught, and then I'm sticking one. And the next step, the next, the next thing you see is that this thing can be written in the following way. Now, 
where this is nothing but x naught on the wave function projected on the position x naught. Um, this concept here, this this little guy here, is a uh, in general um, matrix element in position states of the evolution operator, and as such, the matrix element in position operator is a complex number, and so it's basically a function or whatever r k of x t double comma double column x naught t naught and borrowing the notation slightly improperly from probability theory let me replace the double column already from the scratch with a vertical bar because in probability theory normally when you deal with probabilities you separate the uh, terms where you want to evaluate the probability from the prior knowledge the conditions and in this case, if this was a probability, which is not, and we're going to come into that in a moment, this would be the probability of finding the particle at x at time t, given that it was at x naught at time t naught. But this is quite probability theory, so k is a probability amplitude. And this probability amplitude is convoluted with the initial state to give me the state at time t. So there is a complete analogy with, remember, the electrostatic expression in which I was convoluting my initial charge, my charge distribution, with the knowledge of the elementary implication of a point charge in terms of electric field to get an expression for the for the static electric field so in other words this was my knowledge which is equivalent to the initial quantum state which i'm giving for granted and this is some theory which i knew by solving a simple problem in that case it was the uh, to be, you know, finding the homogeneous solution of the uh, Poisson equation, which, more technically speaking, would be finding the inverse of the Poisson operators in terms of distributions. Uh, but let me go not, not go into that mathematical details here. We'll come to the course. But basically, it's the same object here. Here we have an object that is essentially a, a complex value of distributions that essentially describes the elementary propagation from point to point, just as much as this is the elementary consequence of, an, uh, of a point on the, on the electrostatic fields. So, by rewriting this one more time, we have reached the conclusion that the wave function is time t is the, oh, sorry, is the convolution between the Feynman's propagator and the initial state. And it's called a propagator because it propagates in time the information I have on my initial quantum state according to the dynamics that is dictated by the Schrodinger equation. So I think everybody is quite clear now that if we know the solution, if we can compute this, then we have solved the problem. We have reduced the problem to quadrature. Just as much as if I can compute the electrostatic of a point charge, then up to a quadrature problem, I can solve the electrostatic of any charge simply by adding up. And this analogy, this parallelism between Poisson equation on the one hand and Schrodinger equation on the other hand, is not just a coincidence, because both equations are basically linear equations, so they obey a superposition principle. And this is what makes this parallelism running through the theories and through a much wider class of physical theories and mathematical expressions in general. Okay, so the real question is, how do we evaluate this? Now, what and successful is that it's based on extremely simple ideas. And likely, people speculated, or even he said that, I'm not sure 100%, that he got this idea by thinking over and over on his double slit 
sort of an experiment, Gedanken experiment he was discussing all the time uh, in class to express uh, the difference between classical and quantum behavior. Or perhaps that is just a way to rationalize this mathematical thinking. We will never know. But it is an extremely simple idea. And what is the simple idea is the following. So what we want to evaluate now is this object, right? And to evaluate that, we gonna take two simple steps, which if we count on top of the previous steps we had before, that will make step number three and step number four in our derivation of path integral. Step three is called Trotter decomposition. What is Trotter decomposition? It's a way to rewrite this operator in a form that is quite convenient for mathematical manipulation. So what is the problem where all this starts? We all know that exponentiating sum of operators does not coincide to multiply the exponents of the operator in series if a and b do not commute. That's a problem. Now, the idea, though, is to write this piece here into a series of terms which are individually simple to compute and for which it is possible to recombine them into a single expression at the end. And to do that, we use the following simple um, observation. Well, the thing is, what we're going to do is trivially write down this time interval. Let me set t naught to zero, not to having to carry out t naught all the time. We're going to write it as a sum intervals delta t. So, in other words, we're saying t divided by n is delta t. So we are splitting our time interval t into many infinitesimal small times. Now the question is, how small is small for physics? Let me comment on that later. When we talk about infinitesimal in physics, we mean something different than when mathematicians uh, write down their uh, concept of limit, but but let me come into that as we are done with the mathematics first. Okay, so we can say fine, so that means that I can actually write this as n times this action. That's, uh, that's not very, very, very illuminating. But now here comes the very, very interesting idea. And now, since this guy commute with each other, because Hamiltonian trivially commutes with itself, I can only write this, I can always write this as a product from k going from 1 to n. Well, probably I have to say n minus 1. E to a negative e to a negative one over h bar. Uh, yes, I'm not quite sure about this n minus one, but I think uh, no, I think it's n here. I think it's n of n terms. Okay. Uh, okay. Now. All I want to do is to evaluate this between two arbitrary points. So I want to put the stick x and y here. If I can do this, then I have the propagator. And I have the propagator, I can reduce the problem solving quantum dynamics to quadrature. Now, why? Now, as you can see, this formula 
so it tells something quite interesting. The Feynman propagator that I want to compute can actually be a Feynman propagator, which physically corresponds simply to say that the amplitude for the wave function to be at time t, uh, a position x at time t, given that it was a prediction y at time 0, can be viewed as a series of incremental uh, events described by this product on the right side. However, uh, the, key, the key piece of information, and now the, these terms have traded difficulties in different ways. Uh, we have an additional difficulties because we have to make inf uh, end calculations rather than one on the right hand side. Because uh, we have n matrix elements to be computed and then multiplied together. So that's a difficulty. On the left hand side, I have only one matrix element. But I have a simplicity coming out from this calculation, and is that I have a small parameter. So whenever I have a small parameter, I can make approximations. People know that when they introduce perturbation theory, for instance, right? So uh, I have traded difficulties. There's no free lunch. I have shuffled the difficulty of having a matrix element. I don't know how to compute. I put some of the difficulties into the fact that I have an infinite product. And I have left out, in return, some simplicity that is I have a small parameter in my theory that I can play around with. Now, let's move on. So now we want to compute this infinitesimal propagator. If I can analytically compute the infinitesimal time propagator, then I can multiply all of them and get a final propagator out. Let's see. So let's go back to this. Now, the way you do this is by splitting the Hamiltonian into two parts the kinetic energy part and the potential energy part. Uh, let me first do the kinetics for simplicity and then the potential. Now, why do I want to do that? Well, because the potential energy operator is diagonal in position eigenstates. So evaluating the action of terms like e to the negative iv on y would be trivial. It would just be a scalar. In contrast, the, um, the kinetic energy operator is non-diagonal in position eigenstate. Hey, that's the uncertainty principle after all. And we will have to fight a little bit further in order to get that done. But now, you see, in principle, I cannot simply split these operators into a product of uh, terms containing only the kinetic operators and the other one containing the uh, potential energy operator, because they don't commute. However, their commutation relationship scales with delta t squared. is of order delta t squared. So as long as I put for sufficiently many for large n, then I can neglect that. I can neglect non-commutativity. So basically that means that this equation star can be approximated to an infinite amount of accuracy, to any desired accuracy, with the following expression. Let me clean up this. Okay? Uh, corrections are of order delta t squared. So that's where you actually sort of capitalize on the approximation you've made. You've shifted all of your computers, all your complicancy into having to compute infinitely many of these terms, 
But in each of these terms, you can actually make a very useful approximation. Now, you get for free, once you do this approximation, that you can evaluate the action of this operator, which is going to be simply 1 over h bar, v of y, delta t, and you're left with this non-trivial operator, matrix element, to evaluate. And it's not trivial because of the uncertainty principle, essentially. Now, now we use another little trick, which is again very simple. And it says, well, I cannot evaluate in general the action of a non-diagonal operator. Why don't I just diagonalize it? And then read transform back to this basis after I'm done with the calculation. And the basis where the kinetic energy operator is diagonal is obviously the momentum basis. So what we're going to do, I'm going to insert again 1 in here. But this time, 1 is going to be written as eigenstates of momentum operator. And remember, we, uh, a physicist, we like the definition of terms um, in which basically uh, we, we, we use the concepts of uh, asymmetric norm shift shifting in the Fourier basis. But, and then again, it depends whether you use the 2 pi into the definition of the basis vector or into the norm. I'm not interested in these mathematical details, just what I want to say is that, to me, I was going to write this expression here and use it. Now, if you use that, you stick it in here, then you get something that you can evaluate. So let's go to the next page, and I write then, what I'm interested in having is the propagator, remember, at some point, x, i over h bar t delta t I have my 1 and I have my y and I've written 1 as an integral of a momentum state and I have a dp over 2 pi at the end and I have my y sitting right here Okay, this is a phase, and I'm going to write this in the following way, e to the negative i over h bar p dot y, or, you know, again, like I said before, I'm not quite sure whether you want to put this into the definition of the norm or into the definition of the of of uh, this rotation unitary rotation matrix, I think it's equivalent from the formal point of view, but I'm not really concerned about this uh, tiny mathematical detail at this level. The result is going to be unchanged. But now you see here, this is diagonal and momentum basis. So I get an integral. And let me shuffle the p on the beginning of the integral, and now I'm having something like e to the negative i over h bar p squared over 2m delta t and now I'm having e to the i over h bar p x minus y ho oh, look at this what we are saying is that basically the matrix element that is missing, that is the matrix element in position representation of the kinetic energy operator, has been related to a simple integral. Now, no quantum state whatsoever, just complex number appear in this equation. And not only that, these complex numbers basically are the Fourier transform of some analytic continuation of a Gaussian. You can think about that. You know, see, basically this is a almost a Gaussian integral if it wasn't for this i. So you can actually solve this integral. And the result is, guess what? A Gaussian up to an i 
in the position representation. So basically, after combining all this, the result that we have found is that my x e to the negative i over h bar h delta t y comes out to be some normalization which comes from the results of the Gaussian integral with this extra i. You can check on Mathematic or any solvers of integral if you want to find that this is actually the result of this integration, or you can go ahead and do Gauss uh, Cauchy theorem on the complex plane, and getting the same result. Of course, that's how you solve these integrals. And, and that's the final result. Oh, should not write here, should write here. Okay, so let's start to combine everything we have done so far into a unique, uh, in a unified fashion. So what we discovered so far is that the propagator to go from some initial state, x naught, to some final position x in a time interval t is written as some normalization factor containing all this uh, normalization of Gaussians we don't we don't care and a very large dimensional sequence of integrals and uh, finally you have to multiply this by a function of basically the integrand which is written in a compact form in the following way. Okay. It's time to spend some time in analyzing uh, all of the things we have done so far and try to get some physical insight into that. First of all, we have, uh, let's look at the different ingredients that enter in this formula. First of all, we have the number of slices, or equivalently, the size of the interval. It has to be a small interval, or equivalently, you have to have many variables dy to integrate over. How small is small enough? Uh, in mathematics, this concept of limit is very well defined. You have to go, given the tolerance you accept, then you choose epsilon to be small enough for that tolerance to work. And if you want a better tolerance, you, you know, you can go forward and get more numbers and so on and so forth, to infinity, to taste. In physics, this is not what happens. Because in physics, every physical theory you write comes with a scale. Remember, the ultraviolet scale beyond which you don't have control on the theoretical ingredients you're writing. The hydrogen atom, does, the theory of hydrogen atom, does not hold at the GV scale. That's the basic bulk message of renormalization group theory concepts that we discussed in the several lectures before this one. So clearly, uh, when we talk about a limiting procedure, we have to take into account that we are dealing with a physical theory. And in a physical theory, a limiting procedure means that basically the, the, the energy scale you construct out of your variable going to infinity, to infinitesimally small values, corresponds to an energy scale that is above the cutoff. So that you are not able, with the present resolution, to resolve any error associated to the finiteness or specific value of your discretization variables. Stated differently, in this specific case, I see that delta t over h bar has the dimension of an inverse energy, right? How do I know? Well, because it multiplies an energy 
and he is an exponent, so it has to be an inverse energy. That means that h bar over delta t much be, must be much above the cutoff. And the way to achieve this is to push delta t to be small enough for anything that you can define out of delta t in terms of energy to be irresolved, to be in the ultraviolet sector of your physical theory. So as you see, concepts of renormalization group theory and concepts of calculus come together nicely once you start understanding this idea of cutoff and, and stuff. Okay, that's, that's enough for what we mean by n. Now let's look at this integral. What does this integral actually mean? Well, it is instructive to plot this integral in the following way. I plot all my time on the x-axis and I plot my positions on my y-axis. So I have uh, two positions that are notable, x0 and x, and I have one time, assuming the initial time is zero, that it's t. So I know that at the beginning my particle is here, and at the time t my particle is actually here, at x. Now, each of these integral corresponds to the position at some intermediate time. That's my position at 1, or 2, 3, so basically what you're doing through this integral, since they are integral, I can think about them as sums over small little delta y. And what my Riemann integral is, is summing a collection of choices of delta y in each of these frames. For instance, I sum this, 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 or I sum this, 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 and this, and so on and so forth. Now, each of these slides corresponds to selecting a point in each slice, and basically each of these slides identifies a trajectory, connect, oh, sorry, I just noticed that it's a, my final position is not visible, it's somewhere hidden down here, behind the roof of my apartment, basically here. But you got a point. So each and every of these pieces you're summing over in the path integral corresponds to a path, a different path connecting the initial point to the final point. That's why this particular integral over many variables, each for each time, each of which depending on a position, determining a position on a plane, is called a path integral. And each path is actually in the limit in which I have very, very many, many intermediate times, I define in a, basically a function of time, a non-differentiable function of time. So my integral is really an integral over functions. That's why it's called a functional integral. And the path integral is a functional integral. Okay, so that's that's quite that's quite interesting. We have uh, we have seen that the quantum mechanics can be written as a sum of integrals over paths, and that the integrals over paths uh, summed over all share the same initial and final conditions. Um, now let's discuss what this term is all about. Now, if you look at it, this term. Um, has the the it looks like this was the discretized version of a Hamiltonian action evaluated along the path y, because you see if I if I, I can think about it as the discretized limit of something like which is nothing but the action function along a path. Now. This is more of a graphical notation-wise concept rather than the physics concept, because these paths are intrinsically non-differentiable. They are segments connecting points. So the concept of derivative for them is, is not well defined, because there's not a limit procedure as there is for a smooth function that tells you that you get the, the same result if you, if you take smaller and smaller time intervals. No, in this case, 
the more time intervals you get, you keep on getting non-differentiable functions. So these are really intrinsically non-differentiable. So what we mean by kinetic energy here is something completely different than what we mean by uh, kinetic energy in classical mechanics. It's just some energy scale which comes from the evolution operator of the kinetic energy after you uh, represent the elementary evolution operator in terms of position eigenstates. So you identify it as a kinetic energy uh, mostly because of its physical origin, not because this derivative here really has the physical mathematical meaning of a derivative. But if I can combine all this together, what we found is that the quantum propagator, that is the ingredient we want to study, is, let me represent all this collection of integrals here with a symbol, and I'm using the extremes here to say that I don't need to use the delta function to fix the extreme, the endpoints, and that's called, the, that's the symbol for path integral. And then the integrand in this functional integral is the exponent of i over h bar, the classical action of the path y. So this is a remarkable achievement. This is Feynman's PhD thesis, basically. The path integral representation of classical mechanics. It tells you, of quantum mechanics, it tells you the quantum propagator, or so-called Feynman propagators, is nothing but, it can be written in quadrature form as an integral over the paths. Now, remember, our original motivation was to reduce the problem of solving quantum dynamics to quadrature. And this is the main ingredients that enables us to do that. And remember, we said there are many reasons why doing this operation of reducing to quadrature is a smart thing to do. Conceptual reasons, practical reasons being able to solve numerically, and a platform for approximations. And in the next lecture, we're going to go over these uh, different uh, advantages you get from doing this in detail. For the time being, I will not go into that and just focus on this formula and say that we achieved already something amazing. We wrote something which comes from quantum mechanics in terms of concepts that are entirely classical. You see, when you learn quantum mechanics, you go through this trauma in being able to talk about phase space, trajectories, Newton's equations, Hamilton's equations, and all of a sudden they tell you, forget all about that. The real language is wave functions and operators and states. And there's really an abrupt, discontinuous change between the classical language and the quantum language. And this is often a problem. It is very difficult to extract the classical behavior out of quantum mechanics, for instance. You have to go through so-called Ehrenfest theorems, which are a mess and not so very simple to see, to visualize and understand. On the other hand, what you see here is that I've written something entirely quantum in terms of concepts of trajectory. Of course, the fact that you're dealing with quantum mechanics comes at a price. You don't have to solve one trajectory. You have to integrate over infinitely many problems, infinitely many trajectories. So in some sense, quantum mechanics is infinitely more complicated than classical mechanics. And that's for sure. But, but notwithstanding this, this is a reduction of quantum mechanics in terms of classical concepts, trajectories. And we will explore that in the future as much as we will explore how can you get numbers out of this and what kind of approximations can you devise out of the pathological representation. Okay, I think I will stop here for today. I think we did quite a few things. Uh, let's see how that works. I had to uh, repeat some of the recording because of technical issues that occurred on my computer. And I hope that this platform is robust enough to allow me to teach in the future. Let's see. Thank you, and let me know if this is working. If it's not, we'll try to do something different. Bye-bye.